and you are rolling and streaming live. Great. Um, it is 3 p.m. This is the City of Morro Bay City Council uh, special meeting, um, Tuesday, December 8th, 2020, at 3 p.m. This meeting is being held via teleconference. Um, pursuant to Section 3 of Executive Order Number N2920, issued by Governor Newsom on March 17th, this meeting will be conducted telephonically through Zoom and broadcast live on Cable Channel 20 and streamed on the city website. Please be advised that pursuant to the executive order and to ensure the health and safety of the public by limiting human contact that could spread the COVID-19 virus, the Veterans Hall will not be open for this meeting. Public participation may be obtained through um, the uh, Morro Bay City website um, and or um, uh, linking into the Zoom link and or using the telephone Zoom link, which at the appropriate time the clerk will display. With that, Madam Clerk, I'll ask you to establish a quorum, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Addis. Here. Council Member Davis. I am present. Council Member Heller. Here. Council Member McPherson. I am here. And Mayor Heading. Present. Thank you. We do have a quorum, and I will call the meeting to order. I will now go ahead and open public comment. Uh, this is public comment for items only on the agenda, today's agenda. Um, and Zeke, um, I will ask if there's anybody available for public comment. And the, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, the instructions for accessing public comment are now displayed on the screen. So I'll open up public comment. Yes, sir. We have the first caller and caller, you are online. Thank you, Council. This is Sean Green. Welcome, Sean. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, on the, at the back of the uh, the staff report for uh, recommended appropriations, there's a list of six uh, expenditures uh, that I just want to make a quick note on each one because they are all high dollar amounts. And I know I think CFAC didn't have a chance to chime in on these. So number one, uh, $70,000 for repaving the police parking lot. Uh, if anyone's looked at the uh, the parking annex there, it looks like it's in pretty darn good shape for, uh, to the layperson. And we have a pretty significant uh, infrastructure issues that we need to address likely before that one, including Coleman Beach in particular, Coleman Beach parking, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, bathroom has been closed for over a year and it's an essential park uh, restroom right at the heart of the Embarcadero. Uh, number two, $34,000 uh, rent discount to waterfront leaseholders. Um, I, I appreciate that the council is uh, looking out for our business community, especially during this time of COVID. Um, and I'm not opposed to the 74, uh, I'm sorry, the $34,000 rent discount for the coming year. But when you speak of suspending the uh, consumer price indexing of their of waterfront leaseholders, we need to make sure that we return to this the current schedule in 2020 to otherwise we risk um losing essentially $34,000 a year or more based on that lack of compound interest uh, on that discount for one year, okay? Uh, item number three, $50,000 in renovations to the aquarium building. Uh, I tried to reach out to Christine Johnson of the Central Coast Aquarium to find out an update. Hopefully you guys can give us an update. Uh, it seems somewhat misguided to drop $50,000 uh, to renovate a building that's intended to be tear torn down in the near future for the aquarium project. So unless there's some update that we don't have that you have, uh, it seems like we should be uh, holding off on that renovation or using it for an in-house department like tourism or uh, the chamber. Uh, then we have uh, $52,000 to fill the police vacancy. Seems to make sense if they are understaffed. Uh, but that said, uh, our two highest ticket departments in this city, police and fire, uh, have no uh, meaningful oversight like we are subject all other other departments to. And I know that there was an attempt to put together a citizen action committee that had no real teeth or no real oversight for uh, police. I think it would serve everyone's purpose uh, better if we just had a public safety oversight board. So I'd ask you to consider instituting one in the very new future. Um, $50,000 to study a parking yet again. Um, 
I don't know. It seems like we did that pretty recently in 2007. And lastly, the $150,000 wayfinding signage program is one I support uh, because it is one of our rare expenses that is making our city physically improved rather than just maintaining or staffing. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Um, Zeke, next public comment, please. Thank you. Okay. Erica Crawford, you are online. Welcome, Erica. Hi there. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Honorable Mayor and City Council. I'm just sharing some brief comments today to express that the Chamber is supportive of any and all assistance available to our members, especially in light of the regional stay-at-home order and the restrictions to business activity that it brings. Additionally, we support the staff recommended budget action to move funds from the SB 1090 EB fund to the general fund in order to facilitate completion of the wayfinding signage program. This program was begun in the early part of 2019 and has already experienced significant expenditure of time and some money to date. Getting this across the finish line will assist future visitors to Morro Bay in navigating their way through all four of our economic centers, lifting up accessibility to all businesses in the city. Thank you, have a great meeting. Thank you, Erica. Um, Zeke, uh, next public comment, please. And nobody else in the queue has a hand raised at this time. Okay, thank you so much for that. With that, um, I will get my video going and go ahead and close public comment. And this is agenda item one. Um, this is the fiscal year 2021 uh, first quarter budget performance and status report for the three month period ending September 30th, 2020. And um, I'll be turning it over to Mr. Collins and Ms. Lichtig. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council members and members of the public. Um, appreciate the opportunity to give an update on our budget in the first quarter. Um, next slide, please, Katie. There you go. All right, thank you. Um, so we're going to give an overview, just sort of how we got to where we are really quickly, uh, overview of our opportunities and challenges, and then look into the budget performance for Q1, uh, general fund, the TBID, Measure Q, our enterprise funds, and uh, briefly water reclamation facility, and then um, provide the recommendations that are outlined in the staff report and open up to questions and discussion for council. Next slide. Um, they should all be familiar with the Rock Salt Together mantra. That's the approach we took uh, beginning in April after the onset of COVID-19. We did provide an update to council in September. Um, we didn't have a lot of information, just maybe one month of uh, TOT data, um, but certainly um, understood that we may see some revenue uptick based on the visitation we have witnessed this summer. Um, but now we're back uh, formally with the Q1 to council and we have a lot more information to share. Uh, but as a reminder, next slide, please, Katie. Um, we approached the uh, fiscal year, uh, well, to complete the fiscal year of 1920 and then into 2021, uh, a, a very comprehensive approach to basically riding the ship and balancing the budget amongst um, a once in a lifetime pandemic. We had employee compensation reductions. We looked at operational expenses, um, you know, including council, uh, you know, forbearance on their uh, stipend, our city attorney uh, collecting less than he normally does, and then other vendors doing similar things. Really looking at every single expense and scrutinizing it, and we still currently do that today. Um, a healthy use of our emergency reserves. That's. In that, and it's named in the name. It's it's to be used during emergencies, and this qualifies for certain. Um, and we used uh, about a million dollars last fiscal year, and looking to use about a million or more this year to help balance the budget. And then, last but not least, is the federal, state, and community assistance. We do have some CARES funding that's come through. There is discussion of another uh, another round of that. Uh, seems to be endless discussion in Washington about that. Um, but we may see some additional funds in the future. Um, no, nothing certain at this time. The state is offering assistance to businesses, but not to cities. Um, and then, of course, community assistance. And um, we, we, we are very thankful 
for the community support of Measure E, which will bring about $2 million or more a year in annual revenues to the city. However, we will not experience any of those revenues until fiscal year 21-22. So just setting the table um, for, for Katie's discussion of where we are at today, and then I'll discuss the recommendations towards the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, for turning it over to me. I'm um, glad to be with you today, which I will just adjust my camera. It looks like you cannot see me. I apologize for having to do this while we're having the community watch me struggle. Thanks it. for your time, Katie. Not a problem <laughs> at all. So, at this point, um, we wanted to share with you the actual financial impacts on the general fund um, in the last fiscal year. So you would have some context as to our um, starting point on July 1st. So you'll see here a chart of our five largest uh, revenue sources in the general fund. And you'll see uh, the biggest loss or um, underrealized revenues in our transient occupancy tax. And um, in the report, there was a comparison of um, the same period um, year over year, and we've rebounded this year. Um, but it was a pretty significant blow, particularly in March and April and May, um, that the city suffered as a result of the um, early shutdowns and impacts of COVID-19. You'll see that sales tax actually overperformed to, to a certain extent, so that mitigated the impacts of the loss in TOT and the business license losses as well. One of the most important things to remember is that um, the staff took into consideration the city manager and the former finance director and the team that was working on the budget and took a conservative approach to anticipate a second wave of COVID. And you'll see that that's reflected in the budgets that we're currently reviewing in the current fiscal year and in the first quarter. We thought it was important to um, look at both the positives and the, uh, the uncertainties and possibly the challenges that we're facing related to um, the first quarter budget. The opportunities um, are many and um, not listed on here is you have an extremely dedicated staff who is working tirelessly to provide exceptional service to the community. Um, all of our budgets are tracking um, particularly um, all of the enterprise funds and the general funds. Um, the general fund revenues did rebound, um, but there are uncertainties associated with them. Um, cannabis revenue looks like it's going to be a positive impact on the city's general fund. Um, there isn't a lot to um, report on that now, but um, I think by the next quarter, we should be able to give you some uh, details about how that is coming into the city. Um, as Scott mentioned, Measure E passed, that gives the city opportunities that didn't exist um, to replace some of the revenues that we've lost and to do some of the important work of high priorities to caring for the maintenance and services in the city. We're using this opportunity to redesign and streamline many of our operations to not only match our new health and safety options, but really to modernize the way that we're doing business in the city of Morro Bay. And so while it's challenging to balance that with the ongoing workload, um, we are trying to take some opportunities to um, redesign and streamline our operations. <clears throat> Again, the uncertainties are the impacts of the second surge of COVID-19, both on the health and well-being of our community. And that obviously includes the community of staff that provide the services to our community. Um, the business community's resilience is an uncertainty, and there, there will be losses, unfortunately, in our business community. And we're trying to figure out everything that we can to be supportive of the business community. Um, so that they can be resilient. Um, we have found that the 
um, applications for bricks and mortar um, business license applications have declined since COVID. And so again, that's just another part of the new reality of how we're going to be um, conducting business in Morro Bay looking forward. And the Despite anticipating the second wave of COVID and the surge that we're now in, we're not sure how bad um, this will impact our revenues and for how long those losses will go on. I'm gonna to go to the uncertainties this time so I can um, end on a more positive note. Um, again, we don't know how long the stay at home order will last and when our community will actually get access to vaccines. Um, I believe the mayor is gonna announce a flu shot, a drive um, through flu shot um, event that's happening. And that's really in anticipation to give us the opportunity to plan and to practice giving the vaccines. But right now there's a lot of uncertainty around when that will happen in Morro Bay. Um, when will we be able to reopen our city programs? Um, you know, we, we miss our um, community members being at those programs. Um, Kurt has, and his team have done a fantastic job in the recreation division of modifying as many of those programs as possible. But we have lots of other programs that we've had to um, suspend until we know more about when we'll be able to open them. It has a you know, a cost savings or a cost avoidance piece of the puzzle, but because our recreation programs are subsidized by the general fund, there's also a revenue loss uh, with that equation. And then really the question of stamina of essential workers, not only in our medical um, profession and the parents who are um, essential workers trying to help um, kids get through school in a very different way. And, but also our city staff who are keeping up an incredible pace of um, both working on the health emergency as well, as well as their regular workload. And we've reduced staff and other resources. And so we really have to be cognizant of how we help staff navigate through a very difficult and challenging time, not just for our staff, for the community as a whole, but we wanna keep that front and center as a city leadership team so that we're thinking through how we can sustain and inspire and help the staff navigate um, this and keep up their stamina to continue to serve the community. On the positive side, we've made progress on our one water projects. I know that's been an incredibly important part of the city's response and, and trying to do right by the environment. And so um, we've made progress on many of those projects. Um, we've made great progress on the WORF and we've gotten great support from the feds and the state with very low interest loans. Um, the innovative program of the RV pilot program um, sponsored by the Harbor Department um, has been very successful. And again, you'll note in the later part of the presentation that we've unfortunately had to um, shutter that program right now because of the stay at home orders. And then we're, there is investment happening on the Embarcadero, um, both private investment, um, there's grants that the commercial uh, fishing industry has received and that we're going to be looking at um, how we can help achieve the renovations of some of our commercial fishing assets. So just to dive in a little bit deeper on the question that, or the issue that Scott made a point of, um, which is the use of our emergency reserves. Um, as you can see on this slide, um, they are dwindling, which you would expect under the circumstances, but they're dwindling at a pretty significant pace. Um, and once these dollars are gone, um, you don't have that um, contingency to rely on. So in last year, we spent about $1.1 million uh, supporting the general fund to um, backfill the deficit that we were facing. And then in this fiscal year, we're projecting a one point, almost $3 million use of those funds, leaving us with $1.45 million. And again, um, 
we're looking towards the next budget process to figure out how the Measure E money intertwines with um, the fiscal realities that we're going to be facing once we know some of the projected revenue impacts of the second wave and what we can anticipate for our forecast going forward. Um, I'm going to jump into the general fund now. Um, it is our biggest fund and it's where we provide our general government services, police, fire, public works, um, parks and rec, um, the infrastructure of the um, team in City Hall that provides uh, utility billing services, business license, TOT collection, um, keeping our city records and making sure that meetings like this can be on TV. Um, so that's the general fund. We are trending both on the revenue side and the expenditure side in the right direction, though, again, there are some question marks or some areas where we want to be careful. Um, again, we planned for the second wave and the surge, um, but there's also unpredictable results about when we will be able to contain the surge and then the unpredictable results until the vaccine is widely distributed. And I'm sorry to say that we don't have the crystal ball that's gonna tell us when here in Morro Bay and on the Central Coast, we're gonna have access to them. We're hoping soon, I know the county is planning for it and we are part of those conversations as well. So on the revenue side, again, these are our five side. And this uh, slide is intended to um, show you the reduction that we took um, in our budget between 2019, 2020, so last fiscal year and this fiscal year to show that we reduced our budgets significantly um, in order to ensure that we were being conservative and made sure that we had sufficient funds to provide the the services that we were planning to serve. So the red numbers are the reductions, the differences between the 2019-20 budget and the 2020 budget. And they range from 4% reductions to franchise fees, which tend to be a little bit more stable, to up to 36% in our transient occupancy tax based on the information that we had moving forward. The, this slide is intended to give you a sense of where we are at this quarter. Um, so the adopted budget gives you a sense of the magnitude of the revenue that we're planning to bring in. The first quarter revenues is the second column uh, of numbers. The third column is what we have actually booked in our accounting system on the TOT versus what we've earned. And I'm gonna give a shot at explaining what the difference is. So when we receive a dollar um, of TOT, we receive it, let's say in the month of August. In the month of August, um, the hoteliers and the uh, vacation rental um, companies and owners are paying the month of July but we book it in the accounting system as being received in August. So if we want to compare a similar period, we need to actually look at that which was earned between, in this particular case, July, August, and September. And we keep that on a separate spreadsheet and we keep those, those numbers segregated from what we've actually booked in our accounting system, but it's actually what we earned for the actual month that it was where the person stayed in the hotel and paid the tax in. And so you can see that if you go based on our accounting system, which we have traditionally always done, it would show that we've collected 44.3% of the revenues that we expect. So that's the $820,000 that's in the column to the left. But if you go based on what we've actually earned and collected, we've collected 65% um, of the total annual budget. And so if you compare 
that to our budget, that gives you optimism that we've actually turned the corner and we're really on a, on a positive pathway to exceed what we budgeted. And I'll just warn again, and I know that I'm gonna sound like a broken record by the time this presentation is over, we don't know what's gonna happen from now until whenever the stay at home order is lifted. And again, it's a minimum of three weeks. We really don't know how long that's gonna last this time. So anyways, I just wanted to sh uh, share with you what the difference between those two columns are. And then um, the 2019-20 um, is what was booked in 1920. So that gives you a, a, a sense of whether we're on par with what we collected last year, what we booked, and um, whether we're exceeding it in any cases. And you'll see that in franchise fees and in business license, um, we are exceeding what we collected last year um, quite considerably. And, and the same is true for TOT. So just on the expenditure side, I wanted to highlight a few of the um, unusual circumstances that we're facing in all of our funds pretty much related to expenditures. So we've spent in the general fund 31% of the adopted budget. But it's important to remember that um, we made several large payments or semi-annual payments on July 1st or thereabouts that have been booked to the current quarter. So we paid um, CalPERS our unfunded accrual liability, which means that we're giving them additional payments for obligations that we accrued in the past um, earlier, because we could pay it over the year, but we paid it upfront because we actually get to save money if we um, give them the money upfront. And we saved about $60,000 to the general fund for that early payment. And again, that's about 3.3% of the total amount that we would have um, given to CalPERS for the general fund. The other um, large payment that we made um, was six months of insurance. And we got to make that in a um, in two, two payments instead of one, which is traditionally what our insurance carrier required of us is to make the whole payment on July 1st. But because so many cities are struggling um, with the current financial situation, they agreed to take two payments instead of one. The second one is due in January. And so we will book all of those expenses in the first three quarters so there will likely be a similar issue until we get to the fourth quarter with it looking like we spent more than we should be spending in those line items, but in actuality, we just made early payments. The other thing to remember in our expenditures is that there's there was significant deployment of our firefighting resources uh, for reimbursable wildfire um, throughout the state in the first quarter. Um, I included a, um, a chart that showed all of our deployments. There were 12 deployments in the first quarter that accounted for 5283 staff hours. Um, time all year round. Those personnel costs are about $225,000. We also get reimbursed for administrative overhead and our vehicles that get used in um, those efforts. And just to give you an example, just for those 12 um, deployments, the city will be re receiving $52,500 about in order to reimburse the city for, to make it possible for those firefighters to be able to go out and assist. Yeah. Other cities, our, our federal partners, our state OE, um, Cal Fire partners um, to address the ever increasing challenges and um, threats of wildfire 
particularly in the urban interface. So I'm going to uh, move on to the more um, tracking well, both on revenues and expenditures. We're about 10% of expenditures. We've received about 40% of what we budgeted um, for the Morro Bay Tourism uh, TBID. Um, we have curtailed marketing. Um, so the expenditures being as low They are Excuse me, Katie? really our focus on Excuse only the me? things that have to get done. Keep those revenues in our back pocket for when it's really going to make a difference. Par and pardon then me, lastly, Katie, Katie, pardon the me. city council. Car Katie, pardon me. Um, yep. You're breaking up to the point we can't understand what you're saying for quite a few words. If you would stop sharing your video, you might have a better bandwidth. Uh, and okay. Okay, thank you. Sure, no problem. Is that better? Much better. Okay. Do I need to go back? Uh, maybe one slide. Repeat performance. There you go. That maybe, yeah, we do that. Yeah. You, you. you can see whether I say the same things in the same way, right? <laughs> this is <Perfect>. a test. <laughs> yeah, I apologize for that. Um, okay, so back on the general fund, um, I just wanted to uh, highlight that the City has spent about 31% of the expenditure budget on uh, of the adopted budget so far. Um, part of that reason is that we made two fairly large um, payments on July 1st. One um, to save money, so our CalPERS uh, unfunded actuarial liability um, gets paid, can be paid over the course of the year, but because we paid it early, um, we also saved about $60,000, which is about 3.3% of the total that we paid at CalPERS for this, for the general fund. And then six months of insurance um, with no penalty. So basically, we're getting the insurance coverage. We get to keep our money um, until January 1st. Um, but the expenses show for all of the funds early in the year. Um, if we remove the CalPERS payment alone, um, the city spent approximately 24.02%. And so we're right on target um, for the expenditures. We also spent um, some significant amount of um, money on deployments of our firefighting um, personnel on 12 deployments throughout the state. I apologize for that. Uh, throughout the state and um, the 12 deployments equaled 5,200 and almost 84 staff hours. There's 2,080 staff hours in a year. And so we basically have dedicated two individuals if they were just working full time all day, every day at an eight to five job. Um, our personnel costs were about a quarter of a million dollars. Um, and in addition to the personnel costs being reimbursed, we receive admin overhead, which comes back to the city that reimburses the city for having um, our vehicles maintained and what they um, take, what, training firefighters, making sure that everybody gets paid on time in City Hall, um, making sure that um, the insurance gets paid for that matter um, for our employees. So those are um, expenses that come back to or dollars that come back to the city for our administrative overhead um, that helps us support um, our, our other um, cities and federal government and our state, Cal Fire, throughout the state. And I just want to check, are we still good on the sound? You're coming through loud and clear, Katie. Okay, great. So I'm going to head over to the Morro Bay Tourism Improvement District. The, the um, and we're probably underperforming in terms of our expenditures or under underspending, but that's really on purpose because we've curtailed our marketing um, during COVID-19 and we're, we're holding our, um, 
our revenues in our back pocket so that when the time is right, we'll have these resources to make Morro Bay a great place to visit again um, and a safe place to visit again. <clears throat> We're also moving forward with a council authorized project um, to evaluate the transition of the TBID to a five year term, as well as a nonprofit board of directors that leads um, the organization. As it relates to Measure Q, our revenues um, in the first quarter were approximately 11.31%. 11, 11 um, I believe that that is in line with where our, our general sales tax is. And so I'm hoping that that trend will continue. Um, you'll remember last year we actually overperformed in terms of bringing in more sales tax um, than we had budgeted. So I'm hopeful that that's the case. Um, our expenditures on Measure Q are um, at 13.9%. Um, and some of that has to do with the fact that there are several capital projects that are budgeted that have had no expenditures to date. Um, our Measure Q pavement management plan implementation has been put on hold in order to ensure that we were receiving sufficient funds to be able to expend them. And we are proposing to reallocate some of those funds, uh, about $52,000 for the um, second half of the fiscal year in order to um, fund an unfunded vacant police officer position. So this was something that was um, when you expenditures for 2020, 2021, as well as um, a very consistent um, request from the community survey um, that um, the city did in the last six to eight months. And um, Scott can certainly talk to that um, if that's something that the council um, needs. So I'm gonna move on to our enterprise funds and I'm gonna start with our Harbor Fund, who's been very busy today because of the, um, the high surf advisory. Um, our revenues have been coming in at about 21%, our expenditures at 32.97. And I'll just remind everybody again, that 32, almost 33% is really about um, those lump sum payments for the year that we had already booked to each of the um, enterprise funds. Our RV pilot program has been a great success. Um, if I understand it correctly, um, we've spent a little bit more to get it on um, the ground uh, or off the ground, if you will, but um, our revenues have been steady. The revenues are not currently booked to our revenue budget. And so it's um, unfortunately closing due to the stay at home order, but we think that it might be something to consider for the future. I'm gonna take a drink of water and I'll be right back with you. Thanks for holding on for that. Um, we are proposing two adjustments um, in the Harbor Fund. One is to propose waiving the consumer price index increase for 2020-2021. That's the financial impact thousand dollars. We think we can make it is over realization of revenues over expenditures. So we'll be gaining um, some additional revenues. And then we've also proposed to use $10,000 um, from the Triangle Lot um, Fund. And then the second one is uh, an allocation from the Harbor Accumulation Fund of $50,000 to do leasehold improvements at the former Morro Bay Aquarium location. For water and sewer, um, we're reviewing them together um, because they're hand in glove in terms of creating um, a nice and safe way for um, us to have one water. Um, 
water revenues are at about 24.9% and our expenditures are at 34.9%. You'll see that with the harbor, that was about the same level of expenditures as well. Um, I'll note the caution that we come down to when we um, get to the third bullet. Our sewer revenues are about where they should be at this time of the year and our expenditures are slightly less um, than they should be. And that is um, as a result of some changes in the staffing and the structure within um, the sewer funds. The note of caution has to do with our water and sewer revenues. Um, our utility bill delinquency rate has been on the rise. Um, we have about, I believe, 5,500 customer accounts. Um, in April, we had 55 accounts that were delinquent, totaling $23,516. In November, that has increased to 190 um, accounts that are delinquent, totaling a hundred and almost forty thousand um, dollars. The city staff in the finance department does a great job of reaching out to those customers that are having challenges keeping current. Um, we've had some staff turnover, so those delinquency notices have not um, gone out recently since the staff turnover. But after the first of the year, we'll start uh, um, that effort again. We work very cooperatively and collaboratively with our account holders to find a payment plan that works for them. Um, we also let folks know about our utility um, discount program that they have to apply for. Um, it's a going forward um, application of the discount, but we will also make sure that the, the holders of the delinquents accounts knows about that program as well. And then again, progress on the one water projects is moving forward um, as quickly as possible. And they're very complementary to the WERF project. Speaking of the WERF project, um, the WERF project has been under construction and there has been significant progress made um, on site. Um, the council received the quarterly update from the program manager on in November. Um, the first quarter expenditures is approximately 1.6. And I just wanted to assure the council and the community that we are actively working to get drawdowns from the federal government, from the loans that they've offered the city um, to make sure that we're reimbursing the costs that we're covering um, through the water and sewer funds. Um, so this has been a, a team effort, but a, a big shout out to um, the team in our public works department um, who are staying on top of this. And the federal government has been very responsive in terms of um, making those drawdowns available to us in a relatively fast way particularly compared to some of the other not who's going to go over our recommendations. Thank you, Katie. Uh, appreciate you going through all that. And um, thanks for, for joining our team. Uh, she's been a delight to work with so far and appreciate you marshalling all this uh, on the fly while learning our organization and staff and our community. Um, what we have before you is uh, a couple recommendations, and the third is actually going to be uh, we recommend rolled into the second recommendation. But received the, the the report that you just uh, were presented to orally, but also the the staff report, and then adopt resolution number one o one twenty, authorizing staff to proceed with the first uh, quarter budget adjustment, and would recommend amending that resolution to include. Item seven to exhibit A, which would allocate $34,000 for small business grants to the Morrow Bay business, uh, businesses from the uh, Senate Bill 1090 funds that are available in our Economic Development Fund. Um, next slide, please, Katie. Okay, um, and then just I'll briefly hit on the, the other six items um, at their end of the staff report, uh, which is outlined in resolution 101-20. Uh, we had the police department parking annex repairs and repaving totaling $70,000. And it's important to note that's not the parking 
lot that um, uh, our caller referred to. It's it's an annex across the street from the police department, which is in pretty pretty bad uh, shape, and it was damaged by the work going on next door by a crane. Um, the funding will come out of the government impact fees related to police specifically, so it can only be used for those purposes, no other uses. Um, so it is a related expense. It's not a general fund expenditure and the parking lot needs help. Um, the Harbor Fund is to provide rent relief. We've had ongoing discussions with the leaseholders. We are, for all intents and purposes, the landlord down on the waterfront. And just like any other uh, landlord situation uh, with, with um, tenants are in trouble, we're trying to do our best to keep these businesses um, operating and, and effective and of course protecting our revenue sources all the same so these uh, discussions are ongoing we would recommend continuing to allow those businesses that need to withhold uh, payment now to continue to do so as we see how bad this second surge is and, and then come back to council with more recommendations um, the harbor fund for funding for the lease site the old aquarium site uh, great point uh, raised by the caller yes the Aquarium is no longer uh, moving forward. Uh, Central Coast Aquarium is, is just like a lot of other nonprofits, museums especially, have, have, have been hit really hard by COVID-19. So their focus now is really on the core mission of supporting the Avila um, Museum and keeping that going forward. And they're essentially working with volunteers only at this point. So um, we're no longer proceeding forward with the, an aquarium project there. And so I'm um, really looking forward to getting uh, three stacks in a rock brewery open on that site. Um, these are lease site improvements that are not related to tenant improvements. It's really the under underbelly of the building. Um, and we think it's a worthy expense given the revenues that we would render and see in the future. Um, the yeah, fourth is to fill a vacant police officer position that's been held vacant uh, as a way as a, another effort to um, stem the tide or the loss of revenue um, and, and help balance the budget. However, as our chief would you know, be happy to discuss, it has had an impact on operations. Um, our, our guys and gals work very hard and overtime costs do tend to go up because we still have to respond to those calls for service, which have gone up by about 25% this year over last. Um, we feel the measure Q is the appropriate use for the remainder of the fiscal year, and we would reevaluate um, whether it should remain with measure Q or the uh, general fund expense in fiscal year 21 22. Um, the parking management uh, strategies and best practices it's a study. Um, council did approve moving forward with this when we were looking at different revenue enhancement options uh, back in April, May and authorize me to proceed forward. And this is the budget authority uh, we're seeking after the fact. Um, they've done a review during peak season and non-peak season, and we expect to get recommendations or results and recommendations hopefully later this winter to present to the community. Um, that could be a potential recommendation for paid parking or not, um, but it's certainly worth um, the effort given that the last study was done in 2007 and the number of visitors to Morro Bay has grown significantly since that time. So our situation may be different 13 years later. Uh, last is the wayfinding signs of fabrication. For, um, we would be recommending that come from the Senate Bill 1090 funds. Um, we've already completed a design. Uh, we've looked at all the appropriate places to place these. We've done outreach to the business community. I'm certainly looking forward to removing the antiquated signage in our community and replacing it with modern signage that's effective. Um, and uh, we believe it's the right source of funding from Senate Bill 1090. Again, uh, none of these recommendations are pulling from the general fund. Um, so with that, we'd be happy to entertain any questions that City Council has. So I think we have most of our department heads on the, on the Zoom. Thank you. Katie, you can unshare your, your screen, thanks. But yeah, let's, if we can get the screen down, that'd be great. Okay, thank you so much, Scott and no Katie, problem. for um, a very comprehensive, um, not only staff report, but presentation, and we do appreciate that. Go ahead and start with uh, some council questions. I'll, I'll maybe start off. 
Um, have given the fact that CalPERS uh, in this last fiscal year had a return um, on investment of only 4.8 percent, with a discount rate of assumption of 7 percent, and uh, that there's been a discussion that uh, they may well de decrease their discount rate to 6.5 percent. Have we done any internal analysis on what the impact of either their last year's um, decreased re investment return? might have on us as a city and or what the future potential reduction in discount rate might be from a financial impact. We have, we have not. We've not had the, the capacity to do that. Uh, we expect that it would be a significant impact. Um, we haven't put the dollars to, to our pen to paper on that. Um, but, you know, that's sort of why we're you know, being cautious to begin with, especially with COVID, and that was the, with their 10-year forecast sort of alluded to issues prior to any further discount uh, being handed down by CalPERS. So we, we expect that it will be a big hit um, and that uh, we want to think about, you know, how we place Measure E and other things in that context uh, moving forward. Um, so that we don't um, run into an issue a few years down the road where we're looking at um, ma major deficits. Um, so we're going to be looking at that closely. Typically, the impacts aren't felt for at least a couple years. I think CalPERS is sensitive to how um, how hard COVID-19 has impacted local governments, specifically in California, and definitely wary of handing down a discount, which would push cities over the fiscal cliff and lead to further damage to their fund. So they are co you know, cognizant of that. So we expect it will probably have a couple years to prepare for that. But we don't know where they're going to go with it, and they typically tip their hat before those come. Um, so we'll have some time to prepare. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so add, Go ahead, Katie. I was just going to add that um, they actually give in the actuarial analyses that we get on an annual basis for each of the funds, um, some projections about those potential costs. So we, we should be able to run those as part of um, the 10-year forecast. Um, and so maybe we'll do a couple models, but Scott's absolutely right. It's a couple years down the road, but you've got to be planning now if there's going to be a major impact. Great, thanks for that. Are we still operating under the emergency plan that was implemented in March? Are we are, emergency? we are, and that's why we're asking for your approval on filling the vacant uh, police officer position. Um, we felt it was important that, I mean, from a budgetary standpoint, but also just honoring the, the freeze that we've placed on filling vacant positions that, you know, we have to be able to justify that. The position was justified to me, but ultimately the council needs to weigh in on that. But ultimately, every every expense is still being scrutinized, and we're not traveling. Training is very minimum, other than what's required um, by the various departments. Good, I appreciate that. I just wanted to make sure that um, we were still operating under that plan. I thought we were. Um, am I correct in remembering that the salary concessions by the various entities will uh, be discontinued at the end of December? For 90% of employees, that's correct. Uh, one group, there's a different agreement arrangement, but that's uh, for most of the employees, yes. And um, do we have any indication of the sec second uh, quarter of the fiscal year, uh, potentially, and I, I don't want to put you on the spot by saying oh, it looks great or it looks bad, <laughs> but uh, any idea uh, for at least October, November, and, and eight days into December, uh, how we're trending early on with TOT or sales tax? Yeah, TOT, we've seen a precipitous uh, increase uh, in, in recovery from the previous, well, compared to the previous year. So we, I think by August, our TOT numbers had, had matched the previous August, and then September and October um, have eclipsed that. And so uh, those are looking pretty strong. We know there was a major impact on TOT March, April, May. Um, related to the the, the COVID uh, state home orders or sheltered home orders. Uh, however, in this case, the, the new order from the governor does not specify that hotels and to, um, vacation rentals and RV parks they they can ex they can accept uh, within state travel. They just can't accept out of state travel unless there's an essential purpose uh, assigned to that. So we don't expect that the impact will be quite as uh, as a punch as it was in March, April, and May. 
Um, but it remains to be seen how that may trickle down to, um, you know, holiday sales and those kind of things with limited retail and, and, and folks feeling the punch from, uh, you know, the government not kind of reinvesting in unemployment, those kind of things. We may see a trickle down effect in overall spending. But DOT is definitely the first part of uh, Q2 is, is looking good. Good, thanks. Um, you mentioned in the staff report, Measure E20, you anticipate collections to begin uh, in April. When do you suspect we might receive our first payments or revenue stream from that? So we receive um, the money in arrears. So in June, we will receive the money for April. So we'll receive essentially one month of payment um, in this fiscal year. And the way that the sales tax consultant has described it is that because it's a new tax, it doesn't always get implemented in a smooth way by everybody straight away. So I wouldn't anticipate that um, April will be a sign of exactly where we'll end up eventually. And if I recall correctly, we did not budget any revenues for Measure E20 in this fiscal That's year, correct? correct? That's Great. correct. And I noticed your comments with regard to cannabis. I know we have a um, my term two year moratorium on on utilization of those revenues, and um, um, I'm, it, it looks like your recommendation. I just want to clarify it is that we consider using all cannabis funds to go back to replenish the general fund, emergency reserve. That's what our recommendation is at this. Um, stage, and I think that um, Scott and I have talked about the um, declining um, amount that's in the reserve, and that we've got to take some pretty um, bold actions to replenish that. And this seems like a wise investment of those resources since they're not planned for anything else right now. Yeah, so I, I would agree with that, but I would ask, do you do you know or what you what do you anticipate the amount might be, given the fact that only one entity has opened up just um, a few weeks ago and the second entity is not open yet in this fiscal year? Do we have any idea what the magnitude of the revenue um, might be? Probably, uh, probably a hundred thousand dollars would be the floor, um, but it's hard to say how. Yeah, and we may experience what they experienced in, in Grover Beach where there was an exponential increase month over month. Um, of course, that will be tempered when, when the, uh, the other dispensary opens. Uh, they're, they're currently uh, have a lot of crews in their building uh, constructing the layout of that building. So we could see them open several months and that would certainly change that number. So, and thanks for the chart on the general fund um, and the general fund emergency reserve drawdown, you, both in your presentation and the staff report. So I've noted that at the end of this fiscal year, the total drawdown uh, will be um, about $2.357 million, um, which leaves um, basically about a third of the remainder of the general fund emergency reserve if, if we perform as expected through the remainder of this fiscal year. My question is, or first an observation that leads to a question, the observation is that's, that's two thirds of the general fund emergency reserve that has been depleted or will be depleted at the end of the year, which in my mind is huge. Um, what what uh, potential does a city have to draw revenues from other sources like uh, governmental funds, et cetera, and or water fund potentially, if you deplete your emergency reserve? Are there opportunities to move temporarily, to loan monies, to replenish the emergency reserve, and what are those sources of funds? You, you can, uh, certain funds can, can loan in, in different directions. Um, water and sewer specifically, you could do that to the general fund under, you know, terms would have to be drawn up and um, obviously have to be adopted by city council, um, have clarity about what, what it'll be used for and what the repayment um, process will be and interest rates and the like. Um, we don't anticipate we would need to go there, but 
you know, it's 2020, so all bets are off. <laughs> uh, also, the, yeah, the number that we show uh, for that one point, almost $1.3 million projected, that uh, that does include a, a pretty significant whack um, by a second surge. And um, like I said, I think the TOT numbers may hold up better than they did with the first, uh, first surge. So that number may be, I, I would just say that number is very conservative. So we may wind up having a, a higher fund balance at the end of the year. Uh, but that's, again, that's sort of a word of caution. We just don't know. So yes, definitely can use, can borrow. Uh, terms would have to be drawn up, have to be approved by council, and there'd have to be a repayment plan. Okay. Um, with regard to Sean Green's question about the compounding effect on the CPI rent reduction, um, did you mean for it to be compounded or not? That's an excellent question. I, I don't know if we got that far and Eric Hendersby has popped up, so maybe he has some thoughts on that. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I, certainly we weren't intending and, and wouldn't wouldn't write it up such that we would lose the, the compounding aspect of it. Come next year, assuming, again, we get back to whatever normal is, um, we would we would look at the CPI ratchet next time around, and it's going to take a little bigger jump because they're going to skip over this year. But that's assuming we're back into normal times next year. Okay, great. Um, thank you for that. And then um, with regard to uh, the remainder of the fiscal year, um, you guys have been very good about calling out uncertainty, and Katie, you had a list of things that are contributing to the uncertainty. Um, um, I, I guess this is more of a touchy-feely question and, and, and less of an exact dollar question. And the touchy-feely question is, um, and let me preface it just by saying, you know, um, in March, uh, when um, the basically COVID hit, um, we experienced some uh, marked revenue reductions, but we recovered fairly quickly in the first quarter of the fiscal year um, due to actually high tourism levels and um, the opportunity to, to have a fair reopening. Now we're moving in just the opposite direction back to where we were, even though there's this, this sense of um, a vaccine coming, we're probably not gonna realize herd immunity for six or eight months. And the question is for staff, um, are you significantly concerned about these uncertainties such that you think we need to come back in another session and, and, and look at um, scrutinizing um, further budget reductions with regard to expenses and or other revenue opportunities? And I'll, that's a, I know it's a broad question, but I had to ask it. Yeah, I, I, that's a good question and certainly on our mind. And again, thankful that council adopted the budget the way they did with that that very conservative and cautious approach that supports you know, us continuing on the path we're on without having to make further cuts. Um, however, if we see some something significantly deviate from from our expenses or revenues, then then even more so than that conservative approach, then we would be back in front of you immediately talking about that. Um, but we don't we don't see those signs out there. Um, we don't see hotels closing. Um, retail will be open. Um, we do see impacts to, to some sales tax because of um, some of the other businesses that will be closed, but it just we just don't see the impact quite as significant as the, the onset. People have kind of created their own sense of what is right or wrong, whether, you know, I know we have our, we all have our position on how we're gonna approach COVID, but there are those out in the world who, you know, are continue to travel, continue to do things they normally did. Um, and there's in a lot of respects that's still gonna be allowed. And so um, when, while it started in March, people were terrified as to what COVID was. And, and um, so I think, I just think there's a different mindset, especially when you talk about the vaccine, I think it's changed consumer patterns to such a level that we won't see that precipitous drop off like we saw in March and April and May, if that makes sense. Good, good. But if that changes uh, naturally, we're, we're, we'll be right back here. And we have the city manager has the flexibility and authority to make drastic changes on the fly and then come back and seek um, council ratification of those decisions. Well, 
Thank you, and I appreciate your proactive response initially and your ongoing concerns um, as evidence in your great staff report, raising, I think, some very important uh, uh, questions. With that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Council Member McPherson. Questions, please. Yeah, yes, I do have questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, taking a while for me to get used to actually being on screen. <laughs> Um, uh, thank you, Katie, for that, and, and Scott, for this for that great um, report. And also thank you, Katie, for meeting with me yesterday and answering most of my questions about the report, which I will not repeat here. Um, and I'm glad you clarified some of the points in your presentation, so I appreciate it. Um, let me ask a question about the deferral of the harbor lease um, payments. And I know there's a committee that is considering uh, what you might do about those. And I'm wondering if you could tell me what some of those options might be. And are we carrying that as an accounts receivable at this point? So the assumption is that we will receive it, but it does not show in um, our revenues, correct? Yep. Eric, you wanna... Um pop in or do you want me to give it a try and you can correct me if I'm wrong? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in if, if you okay. don't mind. Nope, so I do not. We are keeping them all on the books, um, on the receivables end. You know, what the final outcome is, we don't yet know. If, if we end up deferring some amount of rent, um, we'd have to correct the books. But right now we're just carrying it on the books and not charging any penalties or late fees. Um, you know, the, the options, there's there's a few we've been discussing um, from flat out, you know, a percentage of rent relief um, versus a percent gross-based formula um, to, to um, maybe a lot, decreasing your rent by the amount of, of hard costs a leaseholder may have for complying with all the COVID stuff. Um, so there's a suite of things on the table that we're, we're bouncing back and forth with the group. There's... I think four or five of them that are regular meters with us. Um, and they've been and really great at, at canvassing their whole group so we don't have to deal with six or seven or eight or nine or 10 people. We only have to deal with a few. Um, so they're all, you know, right now we're, you know, we, we, we agreed to bring the CPI um, waiver for now and then keep negotiating on the other items with the hope of, of you know, you know, last time we met was before we went dark purple or whatever our new color is. Um, so things have changed a little bit, but we're, we've still been sort of kicking the can down the road with them thinking, okay, we're going to get to it. Let's keep negotiating. Meanwhile, we'll keep carrying them on the books. So, um, you know, I, I won't say we're, we're landed hard or on any one particular, um, of the, of the options. Um, but those are kind of the three primary ones out there right now. And when do you think you might, uh, be able to come to council with a recommendation? I'd love to get back, you know, I'd hate to, to jinx it and, and tell you something, but um, I mean, I'd love to get back at, at mid-year, you know, to where where we can holistically bring it into the budget and, and have closure on it. Um, but largely it's gonna depend obviously you know, on COVID and what happens and, you know, we, you know, we made certain assumptions, pretty drastic assumptions in this budget on, on what revenues we're gonna do that have, you know, borne out to a degree, but as you've heard, you know, some of the, things aren't quite as bad, at least haven't been up until now, until things really close back down. So, um, but I'm hopeful that we can bring something back at, at mid-year budget adjustment and, and be done with it and get normal again. Thank you. Um, and I noticed that in all of the recommendations with the exception of the one for the funding of the police officer for the next six months, um, we all are drawing on funds that already exist and are, we've got in these special funds. And if you could just elaborate for the sake of the public, uh, what those various funds are, how we happen to have them, who pays into them. And obviously we are not talking about um, spending new money that we don't have. This is already money that's in the bank. So, and, and what can those be used to transfer to the general fund? Uh, right which maybe a lot of people would like to do, but uh, we're not. <laughs> so I just want the public to understand where those monies are coming from and, and who pays into them. 
Absolutely. Um, so I'll just go down one by one. So the police department parking uh, annex repairs comes from governmental impact fees. Those are paid by um, developers to try to defray the costs of um, services provided by public services provided by a variety of departments, including the police department. And so there's a specific amount of money that has to go towards um, enhancements for the police department for them to be able to provide better service. And so that is that dedicated fund. Um, the Harbor Fund is an enterprise fund. Um, the only way to move money back and forth is through interfund transfers for services provided either by the Harbor or for by the general fund. And um, so that's containing the $24,000 um, and then the Triangle Lot Fund is a harbor fund that gets money from renting for boat storage. Um, so it's their property, it's not the general fund's property and it must be used for harbor fund purposes. Um, the lease improvements are coming out of the harbor accumulation fund, which again is dedicated to uses by the harbor um, director and uh, obviously approved by the city council, but that's again, not a fund that can be transferred to the general fund. The police officer fund or the funding the police officer position is coming from Measure Q, which is a general purpose tax, but it has already been allocated for pavement management. So we're not taking any extra money from Measure Q. It's just reallocating it from one high um, priority purpose to another. The study from uh, about the parking management and best practices is coming from the parking in lieu fund. Again, that's a fund that's paid into to compensate the city for investments that we've made for um, parking. And again, it can only be used for things related to parking. So it can't just be sent over for any particular purpose. And then the wayfinding signage is being paid for by the SB 1090 um, Economic Development Fund. Those monies were negotiated as part of the settlement that I'm proud to say I was part of um, when I was here before. Um, and those have to be spent on eligible economic development um, activities. Um, and that has to be reported um, to PG&E and the public um, so that there is a check and balance on that. And then the same funding source is coming, is paying for the um, potential grant money that would be spent for Morro Bay businesses. Mm -hmm. And um, to follow up on the parking study, as I understand it, um, in part we are doing this because uh, if we wanted to have paid parking, we would have to get a, a permit for that or a, a authority to do that from the Coastal Commission and they require such a study before they would even consider it. Is that correct? Yeah, and I also think you, you want to be able to explain to, you know, those who may not under, understand why paid parking would be necessary, particularly like business owners uh, who could see it as a, um, you know, an impact on economic vitality. Um, so it, trying, taking a bird's eye view of, of your parking situation and, and providing some analysis will help either make the case or not for a parking management um, uh, strategies that could include paid parking. Uh, but yes, of course, the Coastal Commission is wary of any infringement on coastal access. They see pay for anything as, an, as a potential um, uh, waving away or uh, just, I don't know, disincentive for those with lower economic means. And so they certainly are very scrutinizing of, of anything like this. Um, we would have to make a good case that they in fact wouldn't be prohibited from parking. You have to have some free parking areas, of course, and um, potentially a, a local parking program as well. But yes, the first step is to have, be able to demonstrate there is a need for, for paid parking to address your parking situation. Okay. And um, with respect to uh, the, aquari the old aquarium site, uh, just to be clear, uh, and I know that you mentioned that we the, the aquarium is, is really uh, kind of 
off the table. So we are talking about not tearing the building down. And in fact, the uh, three stacks in Iraq, are they considering a, a long-term lease with the city then? I, I think they have uh, a, a interest in that, and that would be uh, subject of discussions or negotiations. But I, I'd imagine uh, the city putting the money we're putting in, that they're putting in significant um, higher amounts for tenant improvements that they want a long enough time frame to recoup those costs and, and then ultimately some profit. So um, we expect that would be a subject of um, closed session discussions in the, in the near term. Right. Uh, and my last question, uh, is it possible at all that some of the CARES money or some of the money that the federal government has uh, been giving in the form of grants could cover uh, utility um, delinquencies. Uh, I'm just curious to know if that might be an eligible cost either by the citizens themselves or by the city. Uh, should we not be able to um, collect those uh, the delinquent amounts? That's a great question. The, the CARES Act that we've we've already received, the uh, hundred thousand ish, um, has already been sort of booked into this budget um, to, and we we're able to recoup, you know, uh, fire and police expenses related to the COVID response. So we've already basically expended the CARES Act funds, but the next round, if there's another round, we can certainly look into that. Okay, thank you. And thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you for that. And uh, Council Member Heller, sir, questions? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You and uh, Council Member McPherson have asked most of my questions, but I have a few more. Uh, first of all, Katie, you're doing a great job. You've got big shoes to fill and you step right into them. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your work on this. Uh, regarding cannabis, I keep seeing that empty storefront and I keep wondering when's that going to open. So, Mr. Collins, you got any? New news on that, or when will we be getting revenue from that place? Great, great question. I, I know um, there was about three or four months where no activity was occurring, and we were trying our best to get updates from the uh, the purveyors. And I, I understand they were opening another store in the state, and that that they pulled staff off of that um, to, to to complete construction of that facility. So they're back here, uh, seem to be having a lot of folks working in that space this time. Um, based on sort of where per Perfect Union was when, when they started to, to line up their construction, I think it was about two months, three months after that, uh, before they were open, but it, it could be quicker than that. I don't know if Scott has anything more um, to add to that. I think they've already kind of done all their permitting uh, on the building side. Uh, Mr. Graham, you got anything on that? Um, I don't really have anything to add. I mean, they, you know, they have their, their lead contractor out there and they have the trades um, on site. So um, they're moving fast. Um, so I would anticipate, you know, Scott's timeline seems about right. I mean, they're probably, you know, a, you know, a month or two out I mean, probably a couple months out with the holidays um, from completing their work. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, a couple of questions about sales tax. So we went from the seven and a half percent to eight and a half. Um, so just so everyone understands, I think the change uh, with respect to our revenue is uh, one cent uh, for every dollar spent. Is that correct? So, I mean, at seven and a half percent, the city got one penny. And where'd the rest of it go? Right all over. Well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, can't, the state takes their, their, their whack and then the county and then we get our, um, we have the, we have the measure Q, which is a half cent. And then I think we also get some of the, uh, proceeds in the base level and then you know with measure measure e it's another cent on top of that so the state, has, yeah the state takes the biggest chunk don't they yeah, absolutely of the of the uh the, mm -hmm. of the base level uh, uh seven and uh a quarter they take the biggest chunk and we get a little bit of that and then we have measure q and now measure e okay i just want to make sure that the public understood that this increase is basically one penny per dollar more to the right. city so correct uh, stamina of the staff, I am concerned about that. Mr. Collins, how long can you hold on here? Well, um, I think <laughs> I think we uh, do our best uh, through humor and uh, encouraging folks to take time off and covering ourselves. And, and I also believe the council support and community support has been phenomenal. And that 
that's heartening to to us and and keeps us going and um, we also know that everybody else in the community is dealing with the same exact thing we are and um, that we need to put our best foot forward and, and um, help lead so even though it is challenging, um, we're all in this together. So I uh, appreciate the question, Councilmember Heller, and um, I, I know you all care deeply about our, our well-being, and appreciate that. And um, at this point, I don't see any fruit cracks. Um, I think the, the vaccine around the corner is giving us hope. Obviously, we were heartened by the community support, support for Measure E that says a lot about their belief in the city, belief in the council leadership, and belief in staff. Okay, uh, the delinquent utility bill. So the jump from 55 to 190, so 55 would be about 1% of our customers and the 190 with some quick math, there's like three and a half percent. That's over what time frame? How long did that increase happen? From April until November. Okay, thank you. And as to general comments, so the harbor lease payments, roughly, uh, Mr. Endersby, how much, what kind of dollars are we talking about here in terms of what's been deferred? Oh, roughly. Um, so we've got two, two chunks of money deferred, some from last fiscal year. And I think in, in Katie's staff report, that fiscal year's audited closed. So anything more we received, we've probably got about, 55,000 left over from last fiscal year that if we receive any, it'll get booked into this fiscal year. So that'll be sort of a bonus. So about 55,000 from last year. And so far in this fiscal year and everybody else is, you know, there's only a few still deferred from last year and this year. And this year, I'm gonna say we've got, yeah, there's probably another 60 or 70,000. So in terms of percentage of your normal annual revenue, what, what are we looking at in terms of what's deferred at this point, roughly, you know? Oh, man, math in public, huh? Sorry. I have a calculator. If you give me the numbers, I'll do the... Oh, I have a calculator. I'm oh, okay. Just, I'm drawing the numbers off the top of my head. Um, <laughs> what's the annual revenue, typically? Well, that's what I'm figuring here. Okay. I think... I should, I should uh, that, but. Hang on. Uh, maybe five percent. Total okay. revenues, total minimum revenues or base revenues, are about one point five million. Okay, and and so a, a percentage of the leaseholders are deferring their their payments, or is everybody doing it? No, not everybody. I've probably got. Yeah, maybe four or five at this point that have deferred. Okay. okay. And some that deferred out of last year, a few have carried to this year, but the majority of them paid off and got good with last year. Okay. Thanks for that. Then going to the budget adjustments, the six items, uh, the parking annex repair. Thank you for clarifying that it's the annex building, not the, not the main building. Um, so, it's mentioned here that there's uh, in the governmental impact fee account there's a balance current balance of seventy eight two fifty three, and we want to appropriate seventy thousand of that. Is that correct for the for the paving repair? Yes, it is. That's correct. And I just want to clarify that that's the amount that's dedicated to the police department. Gotcha. Right. So it's not the totality of everything that's available in right. that. Okay. Do you know how long it, it takes to accrue that amount? I mean, do we go through that every year and spend it? Or, and this, you may not be able to answer this, Katie, but um, does somebody know what that might roughly be? That's a, that takes a while to, and that's all based on projects. Um, right. You know, the, the council will be looking at our impact fees. Mm -hmm. I would say either in January or February of next year, um, you know, as part of our fee study, the last phase. But yeah, and Scott Graham is is our project guru, but I, I, I think it takes quite a while to build that up. However, if we have a few big projects come through, then that could sure. be replenished quickly. So it all depends. So do you think on average, this would be like a five-year accumulation or 10? Great or question. Or Scott, any idea? Yeah. 
I, I would. I mean, I would have to go back and look at you know when we've drawn down money from the account first. I mean, I can't really tell without looking at that. Because I know but, the reason. Go ahead. No, I mean, I can't really tell. Other than that, I would say, you know, Scott's correct. It, it, it also is predicated on kind of the size of the projects that we see coming forward. Um, as an example, the, um, the hotel project on Tascadero Road just submitted. Um, they'll be paying significant fees, um, in the form of impact fees from the city standpoint. So, so there'll be some, you know, money going back in from that project. Okay. And then there's also a note here about a new uh, CIP general fund, 915. So is that specifically for capital projects for the police? Is that what that account is? I, that I believe that's the general fund. Um, I'm going to have to double check, council member, just so I don't give you okay. bad information. I basically, I think what that means, uh, council member Heller, is that we have to create an account. The fund mm -hmm. is not new. We just have to create it's a account. project because this, oh, is, this okay. becomes a standalone project. Sorry. Okay. Right. So, but I guess the where I'm, where I'm getting to on this, I'm just wondering uh, the seventy-eight thousand uh, dollars. Aren't there a number of, of uh, capital needs that the police department has talked about and wants done and uh, is this the most important of them at this point in time? And so I don't know if Chief Cox, you can answer that or? Uh, yes, sir. And with the with the limited amount that's there, uh, this is a project that's been pending uh, for years. And, and I don't know, I, I've submitted some photographs of the annex parking lot. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to look at those. Uh, the majority of that parking lot has never been paved, so it's it's dirt. Uh, it, it's really a dilapidated lot with, with dirt and, and some gravel in it. Uh, and it's something that we use on a daily basis. Our, our employees park in there. We keep all of our uh, police volunteer vehicles, our radar trailer, our message boards, uh, our, our police motorcycles, uh, our bicycles, you know, we, uh, it's a majority of storage and it's also got additional evidence storage for us as well. So it's something that we use daily. Uh, and, and again, the parking lot is in such poor shape. Uh, you know, it's riddled with, with potholes and some ruts and now some, some damage from uh, a crane uh, that they utilized when they put in the, the new coffee shop, uh, that it also damaged the, the wire electronic mechanisms that control the gate. Uh, so the gate uh, really does not operate correctly. And uh, recently we just had the gate uh, automatically close on one of our employees' vehicles uh, because of it not operating uh, properly. So it really is something that's in, in, in bad repair and something that would really be uh, useful for us to be able, because it is something that we utilize every day for, for a variety of our equipment and vehicles. And, and, and it, to be okay. clear, and I, I know that, that you understand this, Councilman Heller, but just for the public, that those funds couldn't be used to purchase vehicles or pay for staff in the police department. It's 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 hard construction, and you know the chief won't say it, um, but you know the police station is old, um, significantly old. And I've heard him say that. Yeah, he won't say it publicly. Um, <laughs> well, unfortunately, that that fund is limited, and, and the, right. the, the repairs exactly. that we would need for the department would would far exceed that. So Correct. It's multi the, multi million. Yeah, we're, we're trying to make the best use of, of the of the funds uh, for something else that we use on a, on a uh, daily basis. I'm sure you are. Thank you for that explanation. Now, there's some damage done by the crane. Are you convinced you're going to get your ten thousand uh, dollars? We're working with the the owner of, of that business, and uh, they they work, worked out a, a resolution with us that they will pay us uh, for the damages that were caused by their equipment. Uh, when they were setting that building. So we've already uh, worked that out with them. Uh, and that's part of the project account that, that our city staff had set up so that we would be able to put uh, their reimbursement for the damages into that account. Okay, great. Thank you for that. That's all for that item. Let's see. The uh, Okay, the appropriation of 50000 uh, so I thought we had talked about this and resolved this, but I guess maybe I needed to come back to council here. Um, so it's coming from the, car the Harbor Accumulation Fund uh, for leasehold improvements. Well, you know, I just want to get three stacks in a rock if that's who ends up leasing the place, get them up and running as soon as possible. So I just see an opportunity here if we move forward with this. Is there some way that we can expedite the work that the city has to do in order to get uh, this thing turned over to the leaseholder as soon as possible? Any ideas? I know everybody's busy. 
I'll, I'll, I'll jump back in. I'm, I'm working with Three Stacks as engineer and their construction manager on uh, more so their engineer because I'm going to use that person to, to do the engineering we need to do so it all works together um, and we're cohesively working on the same plan. So I'm, she's working up those plans now. And it's just a matter of getting some estimates and then um, putting some contracting out um, to bid for that work. Or some okay. for that work, depending on the on the dollar amount and where our contracting goes, whether I have to bid or not. So I'm, I'm knock on wood. I think I'm, I'm <laughs> going to get comfortably ahead of three stacks, and then they're part of the project. Uh, they've got a lot more to do, as you know, on in the interior of that building than yeah. we have to do. Yeah. Okay. Let me know if I can help in some way. The next one, the police officer vacancy. So the money would take basically the way I did it. It'll take us through three quarters. Uh, so, Chief, what happens if the end of three quarters our financial position is not approved much, uh, and you have this officer that we can no longer support? Well, uh, good question. We're, we're hoping that uh, the Measure E funds will pick up at that point uh, after the end of this first fiscal year, and that we'll make up that difference. Uh, again, we want people to understand we're, we're not adding a position. Uh, we're, we're trying to fill a vacant position that we've held uh, open uh, since March, since the COVID thing uh, uh, first took uh, place. So, again, we, we've seen such an increase in about 25, 30 percent increase in calls for service and the workload that these guys are handling. So, so we're really just trying to fill that spot that, that we've held. Um, and I will share with you that because it'll be coming out over the next day or two, but uh, I, I've got another officer that's turning in a resignation today. Uh, so I'm going to have to fill another position. So, so if I don't work on filling this vacancy, you know, if it takes me another month or two uh, to fill this upcoming one, then I'm back down two positions. Uh, and again, as you know, I, I have to train these guys. It takes four months of FTO uh, to get them to where they can operate as a solo police officer by themselves. Uh, and, and we've had to do that over the last two years on a consistent basis uh, where we've replaced nine positions. Um, so, mm -hmm. so we've really got to, to work on keeping a consistent staff here, uh, keeping them available and healthy to keep this community safe. And that's what we're trying to do. I know how hard you work to find good people. So your calls are up 25%. Can you talk to me about what those are? Is it just more of the same or is it different kind of calls? Well, I'm just curious. A great question. And, and they're a little bit of everything. A lot of it is, is COVID related, uh, but we're seeing an influx of people that have come into the area, even though there have been stay at home orders uh, for quite some time. Uh, people continue to flock uh, to the central coast. Uh, they can't travel out of state. A lot of them can't travel other areas, so they're continuing to come into the central coast area. Um, I'll give you an example. We uh, we did a comparison to, to our closest uh, agency, which is the, the Slow County Sheriff's Office, who out of their uh, Los Osos substation, they cover Los Osos, Cayucas, and Cambria. Uh, and, and our agency uh, runs on average uh, about 200 to 300 calls for service a month more uh, than that agency in all three of those communities combined. Oh. So uh, we're extremely busy, uh, and with this influx of people, uh, used to, we used to see it kind of on a weekend basis. Uh, now we're experiencing it every week, where we're just seeing this number of increased people. Uh, and with them come uh, all kinds of calls for service, from, from disturbing the peace and, you know, just traffic calls and, and other related calls as well. So uh, that, we don't see uh, any sign of that slowing down anytime soon. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, moving on to the next item, the parking management strategies. I just, in case the public has forgotten, we desperately need revenue. And I think um, this uh, parking study, even though we did one in 2007, uh, we're looking at it as a possible source of future revenue. So it's important. Uh, the questions I have about it are, um, so we have an unassigned fund balance of $385,000, just about. Um, this appropriation, does it cover the whole scope, including um, getting this through the Coastal Commission, or is this like an initial study? You know, I'm always kind of curious about the consultant right. agreements and what we're actually getting uh, for for the dollars that we're paying for it. So maybe you can enlighten me on that. Yeah, so this, uh, this study will get you uh, a couple things. It gets you uh, some data collection, it gets you data analysis, and then it gets you an expert in parking. 
to tell you, you know, from based on what they're pulling from the analysis, what a good um, approach to parking management would be for your community. Um, based on all the work they do throughout the state. So I think typically you you would go from there to say, okay, we want to pursue paid parking. Um, There may be some follow-up work to to develop the system. Um, That being like, is it going to be parking meters? Is it going to be paid parking lots? Is it going to be online apps or, you know, the like, um, and set up a, a parking office, if you will. So I think there's going to be, further stuff down the road, but to get us um, to the point where council can, and PWAB and then council can say, we think this parking management strategy is a good idea and we'd like to move forward. Um, that would authorize us to move forward to the Coastal Commission. Uh, there may be a little bit of support they would need to provide us, but we would typically take that from there. We don't leave it up to our consultants to, to push forward something like this at the Coastal Commission. So. Uh, but if there's support at the Coastal Commission level, then we would have further consultant work to set up a system. I hope that makes sense. It does. And yeah. uh, so it could conceivably, we could spend this money on this report, it goes to Coastal, and they could shoot it down or modify it significantly or whatever. Correct. Right. I would expect uh, a minimum modify significantly. Okay. <laughs> that sounds about right. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so the crux of this, typically, whenever you mention paid parking, is business owners don't want it in front of their store, or maybe they do want it. How how is how is this consultant going to deal with that fundamental issue about paid parking in our town? We've never had it. Uh, it's a problem for my business, not a boom. Uh, how is this consultant different from anybody else, and how are they going to resolve that issue? Yeah, that that's a great question. I think um, it, it, it. I've had conversations it, when we did the um, we looked at closing down one lane on the Embarcadero. Um, parking became a very, <laughs> yeah, parking became a very important yeah. topic, you know, believe it or not, with business owners when we talked yep. about losing parking spaces. And and it became clear that, uh, you know, uh, staff use park, you know, park in some areas, maybe in lucrative spots, and they, they understand that. And they don't really know how to address that other than, you know, saying, please don't do that. But they're, they have to worry about their business and not managing parking. Um, and it was very clear that parking is a premium down the waterfront based on the conversations we had with 15 to 20 uh, business owners. So um, they may not like it, but I also think they understand that there's economics at play and it helps drive decision-making about parking. If every parking spot is free, staff are going to park as close as they can to where they want to be. Tourists are going to park as close as they can. Owners of businesses may even do the same thing at their own expense. Um, so it, it's walking them through that. Of course, the analysis has to support it. If it doesn't support it, then you're not going anywhere with this conversation. But if it does, then it's an outreach piece. And we would fully expect to to work with the chamber and, and um we have it in the, the consultant agreement to do several meetings with business owners. Um, and then ultimately PWAB and then council if it gets that far. Well, okay. That's, yeah. that's the big question. Yes. Uh, sir. Let's see. And then the wayfinding sign, gosh, you know, the wayfinding sign has been talked about for so long. And uh, now that it's coming up and um, the, the SB 1090 funds, which, you know, come from the Diablo, Canyon uh, closure has a balance of five hundred and ninety-four thousand dollars in it. Can we use those for anything, or what, what are what are our limitations on how we use those funds? Yes, uh, as as, as Miss Lute um, explained, and she was part of the negotiation of the the consortium of cities uh, or coalition of cities. That is, um, that the purpose was really to sort of prepare some respects for the the loss of um, economic uh, vitality provided by the operation of Diablo and the job creation from that. Um, But there wasn't a lot of specificity short of it needs to be uh, economic development related. Um, I think it was intentionally open-ended in that way, but not meant to be sort of a backfilling of city um, services. So they asked for, you know, annual reports. Um, the county is collecting, collected that information from all the cities and submitted the PG&E. Um, I imagine that would be reviewed by the Public Utilities Commission. And if there's some irregularities, it could be an issue for that city. So 
Um, that's why we're being very careful and just saying it's only for economic development purposes. Some other cities have used, I believe, used this set of built-in 90 money for wayfinding as well. Um, others have used it for um, projects. Uh, others are using it like we are to pay for economic development staff or contracts. So I think we're pretty much in line with what our partner uh, agencies are doing. Okay, so it's economic development in general. So it could be used possibly for infrastructure work at the Embarcadero or something like that? It could. I think if you could make the argument that that's uh, whatever that improvement is, it has a direct linkage. Um, you know, for instance, uh, not exactly the same, but Pismo, you know, did upgrades to uh, their main thoroughfare uh, using TBID funds, and they made the argument to their hoteliers that that was going to spur. Oh, you help spur overnight stays in, in their hotels by sprucing up the location. So uh, absolutely could be utilized in that respect. Um, that being said, it built to 90. Um, one thing to note is that, uh, as you mentioned, it has been talked about a lot. There has been discussions with the four um, business districts. There seems to be a lot of support um, from the businesses that we move forward because our signage is so bad and antiquated and unreadable in some locations and highlights things like our Coast Guard office. Uh, you know, maybe it made sense then. No, I'm sorry, Eric. <laughs> didn't say the Harbor office. Um, but uh, so, you know, I think our business community does want to see this move forward, but your point is, 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 on, is, is right that it could be used for, for projects that have an economic development relation. Okay. And yeah. then my other question about uh, SB 1090 has to do with the small business grants. So from the $594,000, and it states in here that we use 29,000, it will allow us to use 50,000 in the future. What yeah, is that? So let me explain that. Uh, so council authorized $100,000 um, several meetings ago to launch this grant program. Uh, we received uh, the first round of applications and you're granting, uh, let's see, um, $84,000 in grants. Uh, we we uh, will be announcing that at um, the council meeting tonight and then the press release tomorrow. Um, and we believe that there's, with that $16,000 remaining from the original 100,000, if you add 34, you get 50,000. It's a nice round number especially in light of the new order from the governor and some businesses having to shutter or um, significantly uh, curtail their activities that this may help a couple of businesses stay open or survive uh, the surge. So that that's why the $50,000 is, is thrown out, but in reality, the, the total program would be um, $100, $134,000. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Those are all my questions. Thank no you. Problem. Thank you. Council member Addis, questions please. Yep, I had to put my unmute. You're there. Um, I'm here, I'm here. Uh, I have, most of my questions were answered. Um, I'm glad to hear that we'll get something back, hopefully mid-year about the Harbor Fund. And I had a question about the police officer vacancy. So that's important for people to know. I think a lot of people voted for uh, the new sales tax because they had the understanding that it would be used to fund safety services. So I'm glad to know that that's uh, the plan for that funding if we're able to fund the uh, new police or the existing vacancy anyway. But then one thing I was wondering if you could talk about just briefly is I know that paid parking money is restricted, but what are some of the things surrounding cities have used their paid parking money for? Well, Katie can actually lighten us a little bit on that, um, but you know, <laughs> in, in talking with Pismo and the work I did in Santa Cruz on our parking fund there, uh, their fun, parking fund there, sorry. Um, you build up revenues over time and it allows you to do more things with it. But the, the main purpose in a lot of respects is to pay for itself, pay for the staffing, pay for the infrastructure. Of course, parking technology is rapidly uh, improving over time and, and, and moving towards a touchless uh, uh, system in some respects because of COVID. 
Um, so that those costs could be coming down, but ultimately it's supposed to pay for itself. And then over time, if parking needs grow, you can pay for parking lots or decks in that case. Um, and, and I think the argument can be made that it can help support uh, adjacent infrastructure, whether it's sidewalks that connect to, or the streets that connect to, or uh, adjacent parks or parklets, you know, those kind of things. I, I think the argument can be made that there's a, a nexus. Um, but if you start t pulling from the revenue and, and paying for police officers that have nothing to do with the, the parking system itself, you could run into trouble uh, legally. So that's that's sort of my basis of understanding. And, and Katie um, may have additional insights on that, but it's a good question. Yeah, I'll just add that I've seen um, cities do it differently um, in the different places where I've worked. Um, some have a setup for a parking fund and they are more restrictive. Others have had the parking expenses associated with installing the infrastructure and um, doing everything that has created the opportunity to create the parking um infrastructure through the general fund anyways. And so they've kept it in the general fund. And so there are there are no restrictions basically for where you put the, those dollars. And so it depends on, in my experience, based on uh, four different cities, three of which have a robust parking program, um, that it just depends on how it gets set up from the outset. And so, um, so I would suggest to you that um, from that experience, it would be important to have some input from the consultants, I would guess, um, in terms of what are best management practices, in terms of how to set that up and making sure that we're talking to that um, person who does this across the state, because I, granted, I have some experience, but, and Scott has experience, and I'm sure there are other people on staff who have experience, but it would be valuable to have somebody else's insights into what's the best way to structure it. And I, in a way, I, I sort of, I swear, the way I sort of look at it is that, that you're paying for, you're paying a, a fee basically for a service. Mm -hmm. You know, but if you're that payment is going to pay for something unrelated to your service that you sort of could run into Prop 218 issues. I, and that's sort of my understanding. But again, it's it, 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 it's all about a risk assessment. Yeah. And, yeah, right. um, and Mr. Newheimer was surprised is that him and his books haven't popped up. But yeah, <laughs> uh, I, would, I would imagine he's thinking about that, too. But maybe he's on a snack break. And I, and. I've had heard the argument be made until Chris comes in um, that you're actually renting the dirt on which the parking space sits. And so it's no different than a lease, right? So you're just paying a dollar an hour or whatever you're paying an hour to be able to lease that or rent that space. So that's why it's different, at least in the places where I've been, than the fee for service model where you can't. Um, make more than it costs to um, provide that service. So it sounds like we're going to have a robust conversation among staff members even before we get much further. Definitely. <laughs> I guess that I'm just thinking as we frame this, or, you know, what are the questions we should be asking? Um, so that if we're thinking about it in terms of revenue generation, and it's come to council a number of times when we talk about budget as one option of revenue generation, that um, we're pretty clear about what our goals are and how we can get, you know, how we can get to those goals. And I think, um, I know speaking for myself, you know, one of the questions I have is, is this going to help us beyond just, you know, paying? to pay for parking like what you know what else can we do and and how do we get to that place um and i think it's important for our, our public to know as well you know what are the benefits that could come from this besides people you know not parking in that 
couple space, few spaces for a certain amount of time. Right, and I and I think that um, depending on the consultant you talk to, I think some that are more on the advanced side would argue that uh, parking management increases economic vitality through turnover. Um, and the very business owner who's afraid that if there's a parking meter in front of their business actually stands to benefit from that because the, high, the, the consumer that's coming to buy something in their shop is more likely to park there and leave. Um, and it, op it opens it up another opportunity for the next consumer to do that, where if, if somebody's parked in that space for eight hours, that's a loss to that business potentially. So um, even if you weren't spinning off revenue for other uses, you still have an economic development argument to be made. Um, and I think, you know, it all largely just depends on how much revenue you can generate, you know, will we'll dictate what more you can do. So mm -hmm. all these things would have to be discussed at, to Councilmember Heller's point through further analysis, I would say. Uh, Council Member Addis, uh, if I could just weigh in briefly on the issue of what the uh, revenue is generated by uh, any activity that the city is charging um, a fee or an amount for, uh, that activity has to be actually examined to see whether it is um, uh, being charged to offset city costs or whether or not it's just simply somebody using a city service that we don't have to necessarily provide. Uh, so to break it down to brass tacks, um, as um, the interim finance director uh, pointed out, um, <clears throat> if it's concluded that the parking spots that are being um, uh, charged for use, uh, if that is just clearly city property that you know we um, can use as we see fit and we can charge a fee for it, and that's fine. It'd be the equivalent of, uh, you know, the city can uh, rent out you know, city property throughout the city <clears throat> and charge a rental fee. And, and that, that fee is just the city's essentially um, realizing revenue that go to the general fund. Uh, on the flip side, if somebody comes to the city and says, <clears throat> hey, I'd like to get a building permit or, you know, I'd like to get a conditional use permit or something to that effect, um, you know, we can charge them for the cost of processing it, but that isn't really a city uh, asset, if you will, that we're renting to somebody. So um, I would echo what uh, the interim finance director liked to uh, mention. And of course, um, you know, we'd want to make sure the analysis is 100% once we go down that path. But um, th those are my general thoughts on what the money could be used for. I think for the sake of time, that's all my questions. Um, I'll just voice support for money from the cannabis uh, retailer to go, you know, to shoring up our uh, reserve funds. I think that's important, and I feel supportive of our other um, the other proposals here, especially knowing that, as Councilmember McPherson said, these are monies that are really. Um, allotted for very specific things. Most of most of the funding that's being asked for is allotted for very specific things, so. Thank you, Council Member Addis. Council Member Davis, sir, questions? Yes, thank you. Um, I just have a couple of questions because of the time. Um, on the delinquent water accounts, I would like to make it very clear to everyone that nobody's water is going to be turned off? That's uh, right. Okay. And um, do you described for me a process of helping people to bring their accounts current. Do we have experience at present of following that process? You, you said also that because of personnel shortage, we're, we're a little behind. Yes, um, Council Member, thank you very much for asking. Um, we do have experience. Um, we've actually, um, since April or March 24th, um, we've initiated, it looks like, um, a total of 23 payment plans. And of those 23, um, we have quite a number that are um, paid in full. Six, seven. So there's um, there's quite a number, of, uh, at least seven of them that are paid in full, and so um, it feels very um, collaborative from how it's been described to me in terms of trying to work with people and making sure that um, 
they find a way to navigate the challenges associated with making choices in their lives about which bills they're going to pay. Sure, and with uh, city help. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. And then um, the wayfinding sign project. I think I heard you say that part of the project will be removal of old signs that have popped up over the years. Is that correct? Yes, uh, the other sign, uh, directional signage would be removed. Uh, Scott, uh, through staff and interns, have done the in initial analysis of those and then the placement uh, analysis as well, but going, going to the next step with Public Works to solidify the location of new signage and then then should go out to RFP for fabrication and uh, installation. Um, but we fully expect to help declutter in, through this process. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, that's one of the ultimate goals of this as well, is to creating better signage. No, that's correct. Um, we went out and um, through a GIS application, went out and identified the location of all of the um, uh, all of the existing signage that's out there so we know where it's at um, and uh, we can find it <laughs> and so we'll be able to work with our public works folks to have those that signage removed um at the appropriate time okay so we will in the end have a single design for all of our wayfinding signs throughout the city yes that is the idea <laughs> and then the last thing it's it's just a math question scott the um you have eighty-four thousand dollars. You've expended eighty-four thousand. You have sixteen thousand left for the small business loans. You want an additional twenty-nine thousand to bring it up to fifty thousand, and that doesn't match. Yeah, and I was supposed to flag that in my presentation. My apologies. It, I, I put it in there at thirty-four, but I didn't flag it. Uh, we had one grant application that made it through um, the original. Uh, timeline but we didn't catch it and it was brought to our attention so um, we reviewed it and we'll be also uh, giving them a grant so that number went up 5,000 so we went from 79 to 84 84,000 um, so that means we're 16,000 uh, to 100 and 34 plus 16 it gets us 50 so we had 29,000 in the staff report but that didn't account for this additional five that we just granted Sorry about all that. It's very confusing. So what is it you're really asking for? 20 we are asking for $34,000. And that will get us to 50 left over. Yeah. Thank okay. you. <laughs> and, and I want to be clear that um, we were able to fund every single application that was made during this first round. Is that correct? Correct. And we had a, a panel review. Not everybody got all the money they requested. There was, you know, some rigor placed on that uh, criteria, et cetera. Um, and, and, and yes, everybody's receiving money. Not everybody's receiving everything they asked for, but everybody has been very, the emails we sent out have been very uh, grateful. Um, and one thing I would throw out, I know it was in the report, I did have, at least one nonprofit ask um, in the original process if, if nonprofits would be included as a small business. And I said, no, that wasn't part of the discussion with council, but certainly um, we could be something we could extend uh, into this next round. If, if council is so accommodating, that's up to, to council entirely though. Okay. And then just finally, I want to thank Katie for very comprehensive answers to the long list of questions that I sent to her previously. And that's all that I have, Mr. Mayor, ready to go. Thank you, Council Member Davis. Um, let me um, reiterate my thanks to staff for a, a great overview and um, a comprehensive presentation and report. Um, I know that um, this year's budget is very unusual. It's a very conservative budget. Um, however, um, a majority of it is, is really balanced uh, based upon significant depletion of the general fund emergency reserve, which continues to concern me. And Council Member Addis highlighted that uh, as well um, greatly. Um, we are depleting if we if we realize our plan um, as as per this budget, we will deplete our general fund emergency reserve by six almost sixty three percent, leaving very little for 
quote, the number of uncertainties, many number of uncertainties that have been listed by staff in this report and other additional uncertainties such as CalPERS um, that um, are plaguing us and many cities or all cities across the state, maybe even the country um, at, at this time. I do believe, however, that the uh, recommendations by staff um, should be supported because um, the uh, sources of funds are not, uh, for the most part, coming out of the general fund, um, but are coming from um, other um, appropriate funds that will be drawn down upon. And I believe there's good rationale for the projects. Um, and so with that, I will move that we receive the fiscal year 2021 first quarter budget performance and status report and authorized budget adjustments as recommended in the attached first quarter budget performance report and adopt resolution number 101-20, authorizing staff to proceed with the first quarter of budget adjustments with the amendment to add item seven to exhibit A, allocating $34,000 from SB 1090 funds available in the Economic Development Fund for small business grants to Morro Bay businesses and predicated on the fact that the CPR reductions are one time and not compounded as per Mr. Uh, Endersby's explanation. And uh, three, allocation of $29,000 from California Senate Bill number 1090 funds available in the Economic Development Fund for small business grants to Morro Bay businesses. Mayor, if I could, uh, the, uh, the last uh, item three, item three is- uh, is oh, item three is the amendment, never mind. Yes. Sorry Disregard about that. item three, thank you. Sorry about that. My, my bad. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second. Uh, motion by uh, Mayor Heading with the amendment on the resolution, seconded by Council Member Addis, and I'll entertain any further discussion. Mr. Mayor, do you, uh, I know the question came late, but do you want to ask uh, poll the council as far as uh, use of the fifty thousand for uh, nonprofits as part of the the small business, or I'll leave it to businesses only? Um. I'll look for head nods. I'm, I, I see. Can I see everybody? I would like that. Yeah. Okay. Put your video on, or, or let me see your face. Is that? I had just one. Uh, Go ahead. I had a question about also if if we would get any kind of report back about the effectiveness of the program, or um, just if anything would be coming back to council. Yes, a uh, requirement and when this was brought forward is that there would be reporting back by the end of the fiscal year, or sorry, end of the calendar year. Um, and uh, we've already got some responses from those that are gonna receive it. You know, here's how I, I've already spent the money basically in reimbursing myself, whether it's rent, a lot of people, uh, PPE exp expenses and, and other other things that they've already incurred. And this is to help, help them battle debt. In a lot of respects, but yeah, we expect to have a, a full report we can present to, to council, and, and also an understanding of the number of jobs saved and businesses that are allowed to continue to operate that otherwise wouldn't be able to. Thank you. Do I have head dots for nonprofit? So, so, Mr. Mayor, we're talking about including the nonprofits and businesses in, in terms of using this right into the okay. program. Yes. Yeah. Am I seeing head nods? I'm looking for no. heads. No. I'm not ready to support that at this time. I need to hear more information before Thank I want to make, make that decision. I, I feel kind of ambushed by bringing that up at this point okay. on the agenda. Okay. And Councilmember Heller, I'm looking Yeah, I'm a no just because I think we really need to focus on our businesses and the nonprofits, obviously, are extremely important, but uh, our businesses are what are going to take us out of this uh, uh, pandemic in a strong position. So. Thank you, and Council Member McPherson. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I, I nodded my head, but um, I think that's a sound logic that we should uh, certainly hear more before you would make a decision like that. Good. And, I, and I would agree with that, and I would be open to entertaining considerations for not profits being brought back um, uh, at another meeting to discern where the sources of funds might be for that. So it looks like we have a majority on that. So the motion stands with the existing second. Any further discussion? I, I would like to, I'm sorry. Yes. Go ahead. Who has, who has the floor? I don't want to interrupt. I'm looking, Council Member Addis came up first, so. Go ahead, Don. Yes. 
Oh, I just, on the non-profits, I'm fine with it to come back. I would advocate to um, understand the number of people that the nonprofits employ. Uh, while the businesses might provide a tax base, the non-profits, non-profits provide a service often to Morro Bay, and part of the service they um, give us is employing people who live in Morro Bay or live, you know, close to here and are going to be shopping here. So, I would like to see that as a piece when that comes back. Thank you. Great point. And Councilmember Hiller, the, go ahead. Yeah, I have a comment about uh, item number six, the wayfinding signs. Uh, when I look at that, I may be the only one who feels this way, but when I look at that economic development money from the closure of Diablo Canyon uh, at $594,000, I think, boy, that's that's really a great opportunity for us to do something special here in Morro Bay. Wayfinding signage is important, but uh, we're looking at allocating 25% of that almost $600,000 for signs. When I, when I keep thinking about what's the best thing we can do for our economy, I think we need to widen the Embarcadero sidewalk so that people can walk along there and not end up in the street. And I personally would rather see, see that money go towards something like that. Uh, I don't think people have a hard time finding places in Morro Bay. Everyone knows where the rock is. Everyone knows where the Embarcadero is, Morro Bay Boulevard. It's not a huge town. Uh, I'm hoping that people will continue to come here in the volume that they have, but I really think we need to, rather than putting up signs, uh, new signs, we need to spend money on, on infrastructure. And I will volunteer to take down all the signs that you want removed. I will do that, no charge to the city. So Thank I hope you. That I can get some support. <laughs> Thank you. I, I will just remind you that um, the chamber, uh, through its uh, GAC, uh, Government Affairs Committee, did a fairly extensive analysis and has recommended a number of times that from an economic development standpoint, wayfinding has significant impact for cities. Um, I, I do agree, and I will stand with my motion, If and I see my second head nodding, um, that this is important uh, from an economic development standpoint and would be an appropriate allocation of the funds. So I'll, I'll stick with that. And looks like my second is sticking with that as well. Yeah, and I would just add that it has been a priority for years, and we've talked about it, talked about it, and talked about it, and now there is money there, and it's it's we need to get it done. And I've seen what a difference it can make in a city like uh, San Luis Obispo to have wayfinding signs and, and how it affects tourists. And I might add that one of my initial experiences here was it was a foggy day, but somebody came up to me, and I was standing maybe 100 yards from the rock, and they said, I hear you have a rock here. Where is it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay. Um, unless there are any other comments, I'll uh, call for the question. Madam Clerk. Mayor Heading? Yes. Council Member Addis? Yes. Council Member Davis? Yes. Council Member Heller? No. Council Member McPherson? Yes. Motion carries 4-1. Thank you all so very much. Um, that ends the special meeting. Um, we will see you for the next meeting of the Morro Bay City Council, which will be held this evening um, at 5.30 p.m. via Zoom. Uh, see you all in about 20 minutes. Thank you again, staff, for your excellent work and your great presentations. Thank, Thank you. you.